a couple of weeks ago, on Halloween this year, I was sitting around with some family and friends. We had had kind of a ruckus late night the night before. It was a lazy day. It was the perfect day for a movie. Some wanted a scary movie for Halloween. Some were not so into that idea. As we flipped through, I found that the 11-year-old had not seen Edward Scissorhands. Perfect. That's the movie for us. It had been a long time since I'd seen this movie, probably 15 years. I had forgotten how good it is. And the plot builds up to and unfolds on Christmas Day. So if you're killing time this year and looking for a holiday movie that isn't quite so sugary sweet, this might be a good pick. Edward Scissorhands is about a young man. I say he's a man, he's really the creation of an inventor. The inventor is able to put together his body and teach him a little bit about social interaction, but just before he's able to add his last missing piece, his hands, the inventor suddenly dies of a heart attack. So poor Edward is left for scissors as hands. One day, a nice suburban housewife discovers Edward living alone in the inventor's crumbling mansion. With great tenderness, she invites him to come to her home. Over time, she and her family introduce Edward to modern suburban life. For a short time, he becomes everyone's hero as he creates beautiful topiary sculptures in their gardens and grooms their dogs and eventually becomes like the hairdresser to go to. It depends on a whole lot of fantasy. I mean, the guy has scissors for hands, after all. You just have to go with it. In a couple of plot twists, the town turns against Edward. They become afraid of him, because he gets framed for a couple of serious offenses. One is a robbery where they convince him to use his scissors to break into a home, but he's the one that gets caught in the process. There's also a sexual assault turned upside down. He refuses the advances of an older woman, and she turns the whole scenario against him. Before too long, the whole town is searching for this dangerous stranger with those horrible, sharp weapons for hands. They turn from appreciating his gifts to seeing the guy as a dangerous criminal. All the while, through this whole story, no one seems to notice just how frightened and alone Edward is himself. He didn't understand any of the social cues or expectations of this town. The poor guy can't even touch his own face without cutting himself. To me, the movie is a great exploration of how the most vulnerable people in society get painted as the most dangerous. It happens over and over again. The most vulnerable people, the outcasts, get painted as the most dangerous. Ever since the LGBT rights movement began, opposition was based in portraying these folks as predators. Gay men and transgender people in particular have been portrayed as pedophiles. They're portrayed as somehow dangerous, all while facing discrimination in housing and employment and religion and being rejected from their families. They're portrayed as dangerous while they were being beaten and harassed by the police that were there to protect them. They were portrayed as a threat to the family, all while seeking the right to marry. The same type of demonization has happened and continues to happen to people of color. While profound racial inequalities persist, while people of color are paid less, have less education, are incarcerated more, face higher unemployment, and have worse health and health care, these most vulnerable members of society are portrayed as dangers, either physically or financially. Over and over again, society depicts the most marginalized, the truly vulnerable person, as the dangerous. 
And no group is this more true for than our neighbors experiencing homelessness. Some of you have been to city council meetings where homelessness is discussed. Every month or so, I'm surprised by the amount of misinformation and selfishness and fear expressed at these meetings. I guess this is a reminder that I should be grateful that I am still surprised by hearing this. Last month, I went to a town hall meeting hosted by Lake Forest. There were city leaders and some local support agencies and police who specialize in people without homes. They were there to give some information and answer questions. Most of it was a good conversation. A couple of people, though, raised questions that just spewed contempt. One woman asked the police, since they know who the local homeless people are, why don't they just have a public information campaign? She asked, can't you publish their names and pictures so that the rest of us can keep ourselves safe from them? The police politely explained that everyone has a right to privacy and constitutional rights aren't reserved for people with homes. Still, she couldn't understand why this was a problem. It took five exchanges back and forth and she finally just stopped asking. Shortly after that exchange, a man told the same police officer how disgusted he was by what had occurred at a bus stop in Lake Forest. It's the one right in front of Ralph's. One day, uh, he had seen a person sleeping on that bus stop there was a woman nearby who presumably was waiting for the bus, but felt that there was no space for her on the bench. The man continued, he could have been dead for all I knew. He was so angry. Why didn't the police get him up? The police officer very calmly responded with some very good questions. Did you see a crime being committed? Did you really think he was dead? Did you call the police? The officer calmly explained that police aren't in the business of instructing people how to be polite and to share a seat. By the end of the conversation, the man was huffing and puffing just beside himself that the police didn't think it was their responsibility. So one of the pernicious myths about homelessness is that it's the cho a choice or the fruit of some moral failure. In fact, the leading cause of homelessness in Orange County, this shouldn't be a surprise to anyone who has looked at real estate lately. The leading cause is the house of pr price of housing not keeping up with the income levels. Another big factor that we often forget is domestic violence. Battered women who live in poverty often face the choice, if you can call it that, between domestic violence or homelessness. For some, impossibly high cost of health care brings economic collapse. And finally, there are those questions of mental illness and homelessness and addiction. We have to be careful, though. Correlation is not causation. The mental strain of living without a home often has profound impacts on mental health. We also know that people who are addicted to alcohol or drugs, many of them never become homeless. But people who are poor and addicted are clearly at increased risk for homelessness. There are a bunch of different causes. As Cheryl put it, as many causes as those there are people out there. It is very, very, very rarely about a choice. This is sad stuff, homelessness and its causes. And when we're confronted with the profound uncertainties of life, I'm often reminded of the book Ecclesiastes from the Old Testament. 
you're probably familiar with it from the song by the birds. Turn, turn, turn. You know, a season for every purpose under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die and so on and so on. It basically says that life isn't fair. Good things happen to bad people and some terrible things happen to really good people. Worrying and wringing your hands about it isn't going to solve anything. So get on with your life. Now the book of Ecclesiastes stands out so much to me because it goes against what the vast majority of religion teaches, especially the Abrahamic traditions. For the most part, religion teaches that in the end it all gets worked out, either with karma or God, or some other mechanism that makes life fair in the end. One version you've probably heard of is Prosperity Gospel. Prosperity Gospel says that God will provide material wealth for those he favors. Pray harder and God will bless you with more income. And it's easy to point fingers or dismiss that kind of belief system. But even without a church that preaches prosperity gospel, we still want to believe that the world is fair. We want to believe that our work will be rewarded, that we'll be safe if we do the right things. The secret is life is not that in control. We're born to a random family of a random race, of a random class. We inherit predispositions for addiction, maybe mental illness, and along the way random opportunities and challenges impact us. We might stumble into a job or an educational opportunity, or we might encounter some physically or emotionally disabling tragedy along the way. The level of chaos is pretty scary. In the face of uncertainty, we want to believe that we got where we are because we're good people. We want to believe that we will stay where we are if we just keep on track. Homelessness is a lot less scary if you think it, of it as someone else's moral failure or choice. Homelessness is scary because any one of us could have been dealt those same circumstances. This topic seemed to fit nicely in our month of nonviolence at Tapestry. That's our worship theme for the month. And I'm glad that nonviolence is a concept that we're aware of in popular culture. We know that it's a really effective strategy for social change. It's also a theology of love, like I talked about last week. In our universalism, it's a belief that love wins, not violence or punishment, but love being the most powerful force. Beyond a strategy or an idea, nonviolence is also a personal spiritual discipline, a discipline of the heart. You might think of it as paying attention and when fear and anger arise, trying to carve out some space for love and compassion. Since the pandemic began, several of us have been meeting on Wednesday nights for a small uh, mindfulness meditation group. We've doing, been doing all sorts of different practices that we can then continue to do on our own throughout the week. And one of those is a body scan. You've almost certainly done this yourself in some setting. It's a process of bringing awareness to your body in small, particular details. Starting with your head, going slowly all the way down to your toes. Are you furrowing your brow? Are your eyes clenched tightly or are they gently closed? Is your jaw tense? Is your tongue relaxed? and so on, all the way down. It's an opportunity to invite relaxation 
into every muscle over time. Great way to wind down before bed. The other thing you come to learn is how much sensation your body has that you ignore. There are things like the temperature of the air on your skin that you don't pay attention to. You might feel fatigue or fidgetiness. You might have sensations of hunger or digestion occurring. This past week, as I invited people to notice what they felt, sensations of breathing, I could feel the slight stretch and brush of fabric on my chest, shoulders, and back as my body expanded and contracted. There's so many sensations, so much data that gets ignored if we don't pay attention to it. Slowing down to become aware of those subtle sensations is a tool for learning to notice the emotions that occur in our bodies. After all, emotions aren't ideas that pop up like words in our brains, they're sensations in our body. We're no, we know we are angry because of sensations. We have a heart rate or a, that constricted feeling in the chest or increased energy and alertness. Slowing down can help us understand what's going on in the moment. So, whether you meditate or not, the next time you encounter a person who you know is homeless, I invite you to pause and slow down. And just as you would observe sensations in your body without judging them, observe what's happening in your body and your mind when you encounter this person without judgment. If you're in your car, you may have a couple of minutes. That's an opportunity to take a deep breath and observe yourself. If you're walking, you probably have less time. Wherever the encounter occurs, instead of diverting your attention, instead of judging yourself for how you should feel, just notice. Observe what's happening in your body and your mind. There's probably some discomfort. Some of it has to do with not knowing the best way to help. There may be a sense of sadness or compassion. You may experience shame for your relative level of comfort and wealth. Slow down and notice. Unless this is a person you know personally, or you spend a whole heck of a lot of time around people experiencing homelessness, there's probably some fear in that web of emotions. You might ask what you're afraid of. Are we afraid for our physical safety or because we've been reminded of just how precarious life is? The spiritual work of nonviolence is noticing where fear and anger arise and doing what we can to open space for compassion and love in that moment. Today's sermon has focused a lot on the spiritual and emotional work around homelessness. Fortunately, many of you want to know more about what you can do to materially improve the situation. And there are a bunch of opportunities. One of the reasons Tapestry is getting engaged in the issue of homelessness is that there's a whole lot of movement happening right now. Right now, all of the cities in our area are rewriting their policies on land use that will determine how much housing and hopefully affordable housing can be built in the next 10 years. It's a really big opportunity. Also, just across the, street, uh, across the freeway, talks have resumed about redeveloping the Laguna Hills Mall. You may have heard about that. 
There are plans for over a hundred apartment units there, and we are trying to make some of them affordable to people with low and very low incomes. Here in Lake Forest, the city has approved the building of a new affordable housing development. We have to keep an eye and keep things moving forward because nothing has been accomplished until someone who really needs it has a roof over their head. And there will be many opportunities to write or to speak to city council members about all three of those issues. If you're the analytical sort or a keyboard warrior, as some call it, you might consider being a canary. Those are volunteers that monitor the agendas of city council meetings and note where issues related to housing come up. We call them canaries because they're our best indication, our detection system for when we might need to respond. If you're more of a hands-on sort, we can use more people preparing dinners for the Friendship Shelter in Laguna Canyon. You may know this, tapestry volunteers provide dinner for the shelter one night each month. Or you can always drop off food donations here at Tapestry anytime the door is open. Just drop them by the front door and Judy will pick them up. Lastly, I want to mention a petition that was created specifically for Hunger and Homelessness Awareness Week. That's this week. This petition encourages local city councils to apply for funding from the state and national level to help build affordable housing in our area. Our city council people, our elected leaders, need to know that you, their constituents, want to provide housing for people of all income levels, to have a vibrant community here and a thriving economy. There are lots and lots of options to help. If one of those options tickles your fancy, please reach out to me after the service or Rona Henry. Rona, where are you? Rona's kind of in the back there, but she is our, our guru on homelessness right now and has been leading a lot of us uh, to learn more and do more. So rather than fearing our neighbors without homes, instead of being afraid of the most vulnerable members of our community. Let's reach out and do what we can to help. Amen.